Communication in a crisis is absolutely crucial. Today we're talking with Josh from the American Radio Relay League, and he's going to tell us why you should become an amateur radio operator and how to go about doing it. Hey, Profit and Preppers, I'm Kyleen. And I'm Jonathan, and recently we've been reminded how important communication is. The couple of hurricanes that have hit the southern United States have really caused a lot of problems, and communication is so much the key. So we have an expert with us today. We have Josh Johnston from the ARRL, the American Radio Relay League, and they are the masters of amateur radio. And he is here to talk to us a little bit about what he does and why amateur radio is so important. Also, it's known as ham radio. Josh, can you take just a minute and tell us about yourself and what you do and, and uh, why radio is an important means of communication? Sure, be glad to. And thanks for having, having us on today. And we look forward to a great discussion. I'm the Director of Emergency Management for ARRL, which is the National Association for Amateur Radio. I work primarily with our Amateur Radio Emergency Service Program, which is our volunteer group around the country that works with local and state emergency responders, emergency management groups, hospitals, different different avenues of, of MCOM, and then also do a lot of public service events for parades and, and that kind of thing. So we do a lot of, of uh, training up front and so on and so forth. My background, I've got a total of about 31 years in, in emergency communications before coming here, uh, mostly in Arkansas. I spent a lot of time working with our county uh, and local emergency uh, communications teams and then the state level teams. So it was all all a lot of experience and I'm glad to be here to to help and concentrate on, on something that I love as a hobby, but also believe is vitally important for different communication sources during uh, amateur radio events or during disaster events. So you are exactly the right man to tell us what is amateur radio or ham radio? What is it? So ham radio is just a spectrum of radio that that the FCC allows us to use on the air and it's volunteers. There's hobby along with amateur radio. There are contests where people practice making as many contacts as they can and literally all over the world. Depending on what frequency you use, you have different ways of communicating um, all over the country and all literally all over the world. The radios and the cost varies from a handheld radio that you can probably get into for somewhere in the $25 to $50 range, all the way up to high frequency radios that are going to be, you know, in the $1,000 and up range and um, requires a lot of space for antennas. So there's really something in it for everyone. The beauty of amateur radio is the capability to provide multitude of not just talking, but sending digital signals. Um, and that comes into play a lot in the emergency communications field. Tell us just a little bit about how amateur radio could be useful in a some kind of an emergency situation, maybe something like the hurricanes that have just happened. Sure. One of the things that came into place was in Hurricane Helene was health and safety, trying to get if there were hams in the community and they had their radio they were able to relay, hey, we've got six people here, this person, this person, this person, and this person. And they're able to relay out to a ham that has internet capability or some way to reach outside the area and let family know that they're safe, that they're well. Those happened a lot. I mentioned digital communications earlier. There's a program that is used a lot in amateur radio, and it's a, basically a over-the-radio email system um, called WinLink where you use the radio as your modem or as the communications method to send an email message. There have even been instances where video data can be sent over amateur radio. So you can send even a photo or a picture um, over ham radio. So being able to get information back, whether it's digital information, whether it's health and safety, or in certain situations, if there was a need for evacuations during a hurricane, I believe it was Ian uh, last year um, in Florida, there was a ham who was able to make contact actually with a ham in Massachusetts. And the ham in Massachusetts heard the traffic that they were requesting assistance and needed help in, I believe they were on Sanibel or one of the barrier islands and was able to relay back to Florida 
and they were able to get emergency responders in into them to provide assistance. So it can come into play in a lot of different cases. So tell me why an amateur radio will work when other communications are down. Help us understand that. I'm glad you brought that up and used the handheld as an example. Amateur radio will work because it doesn't typically require infrastructure or cell phone towers or so on and so forth. Now, do we utilize towers when when conditions are right? And we can, yes, we absolutely do. Um, But we have the ability to go radio to radio and talk directly to another ham who may be in the area, but may still have service to be able to, to assist outside the area. It's been alarming to me, honestly, the last couple of years, I've seen a lot of ads for a handheld radio that will talk across the country. Anybody that's advertising that they have a radio that will talk across the country that's a five-watt handheld um, is either A, relying on some type of a cellular tower signal, or they're very over-exaggerating the capabilities of the radio. And it's concerning that there are people buying these things thinking they're a lifeline to talk around the country when, quite earnestly, they're not. Ham radio can get signals out when... You know, your cell phone, for instance, is talking at about a half a watt. A handheld like the one you're holding there in your hand is it is five watts. And as you can tell by looking at it, it's got a bigger antenna on it. So you've got a better chance with something like that than you do with a cell cellular signal, uh, such as your phone or some of these uh, cellular-based radios that are dependent, 100% dependent on cell signal and cell towers working. Okay, so Josh, tell us about getting a license and And uh, I guess this might be a good place to tell us about the different levels. So, for example, Kylene and I are are technician level. I did. Uh, I passed. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that and then where you can go from there uh, to the next levels. you got the three levels, which are technician, general, and extra. I happen to be an extra primarily because I wanted to be able to help administer tests to anyone wanting to. So that was my primary goal for getting my extra. But to explain on that. The technician level is your entry level, and it requires a 35-question exam to pass a 35-question exam that's set by the FCC, and we assist with providing those exams. We have study guides available for people to to study, to prepare for their license. There's online sources available to be able to use a handheld, to be able to use a car-mounted vehicle, uh, vehicle vehicle-mounted radio it allows you to really begin to get on the air and start learning about the hobby and, and about, in a lot of cases, there's a lot of MCOM groups that that's what they stick with. It's primarily VHF, UHF that any technician could do. Once you step into the general class license, it really opens the door for your capabilities to talk on the HF type radios that have much longer range. They could give you that ability on certain frequencies to talk across the country without any other infrastructure other than than what you have at your own house. There again, there's a little bit more uh, involved. As far as the the license, it also is a 35-question exam. The first two are are 35 questions apiece. It's more about operating on those HF bands, um, and that's what the exam will focus on is is the legalities. The FCC oversees the frequency allocations and what we're able to use and what frequencies we're able to be on, they set the guidelines on what must be administered in the exams. The extra class, which is the top class, I guess, if you want to say it that way, is a 50-question exam. It's a little more detailed, a lot more math um, and science-oriented as far as the questions and the question pool. They uh, focus a lot on some of the detailed electronics and so on and so forth. It also opens up an additional section of frequencies that are only open to am, uh, amateur extra operators. Overall, it just expands a little bit on what was already available in the general class level. And there again, we've got study guides available through ARRL that uh, will allow you to study and prepare for those. And that was one of the really cool things. Like for me, I was able to get online and do all the practice questions, right? right. So when I went in to take the test, it was not a big deal. I think, was the test like $12? How much is it to take the test now? It's 15, I believe. Okay, and 15. it and it, vary, it does vary from group to group as, it, as to what the exam is. Yeah, it's not very much money. Yeah, very reasonable. It's very reasonable. And you can learn how to do this. I can do it. Anybody can do it. 
And one of the reasons why we did it was because we wanted to be able to develop a little bit of resilience in our community and in our family, right? So that we're able to talk to each other. We got on these little nets, these monthly nets for a while where it helped me practice using my radio. You know, you just rub shoulders with an amazing group of people. And that was the thing that really drew me in was just the quality of the people who are doing this. They're, they're people who love to serve. They love to help. They're part of the solution. They're not doing it for money. They're out there on search and rescue or uh, emergency situations, and they're passing traffic, just trying to help. And they're just the most genuine, wonderful people in this world. I, I agree completely. And you brought up a great point there, too. You know, getting on and using the radio is one of the best things that, that you can do. When there's not an emergency going on, is the time to get comfortable and be on the radio. When there's an emergency going on, that's really not the time to start learning. So I would encourage you, anyone that wants to get on and get on the air and be available in an emergency, be on regularly. Be radioactive, as we like to say. And I, I want to point out here, you know, when I first started out, mm -hmm. A lot of times I felt like a fool because, you know, I was making mistakes, not serious mistakes, obviously, but, you know, just little, little blunders that, you know, okay, I should have done that differently. But I was involved with a group that really kind of overlooked that and nurtured me to, you know, to just keep trying, you know, because for me, it was very nerve wracking the first time I pushed to talk button. My heart was just pounding. And, and then you realize, you know, everybody's just out there trying to help each other. And what, what a great thing that was. Yeah, we have had a lot of fun within our community of ham radio or amateur radio friends. If you're looking for a hobby or a way to get to know other preppers, a lot of ham radio operators actually are into emergency preparedness. Oh, big time. Yeah. And, yeah. and so if you're looking for a way to get into a group and build <clears throat> your network a little bit and find people who to help, this is a great way to do it. Get involved. If you already have your license, get involved with one of your local groups, you know, contact ARRL. Josh, what can you, what can you advise our audience? What can they do to get involved with some of these other amateur radio people? First of all, get involved locally. One of the things our website has, we've got affiliated clubs all over the country. And we would encourage you to get plugged in and get involved and get active with one of those local clubs. Our website's full of resources for training. Um, we have MCOM training, particularly around our amateur radio emergency service program. But we also have our, our learn at learn.arl.org uh, site has a wealth of training and classes on just about any topic you would like to take. But we also, one of the things we work hard on is, is our publications. We have four magazines a month that go out to our members via digital means. They have the option of getting one of those in print if they would like. They all four go out to, to all members. All members have access to those that have a ton of articles and knowledge. And we're, we're adding video content to some of those now to really enhance what we're doing and how we're growing and, and supporting the hobby. We've got a wealth of information on our website, so feel free to check that out. Awesome. We will leave that uh, link in the description yeah. for you so that you guys you guys can find them. I think the point I'm trying to get across here is we emphasize community so much. And this is one way of building community resilience and the ability to work together. I think it's just an awesome thing that you guys do. And something I would like to emphasize is that you don't have to be a brilliant engineer like Jonathan to do this. You can be a domestic goddess like me and totally do amateur radio. So don't be intimidated. Go ahead and click on that link, learn more, and get involved. Now you talked a little bit about the cost of equipment and training. Is there anything else that you want to add to that? I, I think the point is here, you can get equipment all the way from 25 bucks to, you know, the sky's the limit. This is something everybody can do, and the training is available uh, generally free, and uh, the, the test is very inexpensive. Anything right. else you want to add? The testing, I will mention, you know, one thing that the FCC did add a few years ago was was a licensing fee that's that you have to pay every every 10 years now. It's $35. That was done by the FCC. It's the federal government imposing those fees, not us and not anybody else. That fee is paid to the F, paid directly to the FCC. It's still absolutely a great hobby to be involved in. People tell me you know, asked me all the time, said, well, do you, do you like ham radio for the hobby or for, or strictly for MCOM? 
I do MCOM more as a job. To me, it's more of a skill and a necessity that I'll happen to love. But I like to get on in contest on HF on the HF bands on the weekends and and when I'm not at work for fun. So I enjoy the fun side of it as well as as the MCOM side. And I think it's important to to remember that there's a time for both. Having an opportunity to to have fun with the hobby, as you were speaking of earlier, and enjoy what we do, but then know that in times of crisis, sometimes we have to have to buckle down a little bit and, and be more serious. And I think that's a very useful skill uh, for anyone that's involved. Get on and enjoy it and practice having fun. But then when it's time, just know that, you know, sometimes we gotta got to put our serious hat on. Well, thank you, Josh. We have appreciated talking with you. This is such a wonderful hobby and uh, such a benefit to communities. And we want to thank you for your time. And now for the question of the day, what questions do you have for Josh that he can help you answer about radio and why it might be a benefit to you? So comment below and thanks for being part of the solution.